Hello Adult Sunday School Leader. You're going to have to excuse my voice this week. I have just a little bit of a cold. I did test negative for COVID, so that's good. So we're continuing in the unit that's called It's All About Jesus. This is the fourth lesson called The Death of Jesus. And the focal passage is Luke 23, verses 32 through 49. That's a lot of verses to cover. The point of this lesson is Jesus died to pay the debt of our sin. While I doubt that there will be anyone in your Sunday school class who doesn't know at least the basic story of Easter. But why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't, couldn't there have been another way? Well, hopefully, we're going to answer that question by the end of our lesson. Now, later, uh, later down in our lesson, we're going to be looking at the Jewish sacrificial system and how that pointed the way to the inevitable suffering of the Messiah. There's so much that went on between the Last Supper and Jesus' death that we're, going to have, we're not going to have time to get into this week. You know, there's the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, Peter cutting off the ear of the high priest's servant. Uh, and that happened when Jesus was being arrested. Uh, Jesus goes before Pilate. The crowds are shouting, crucify him. Uh, the torture of Jesus, the torture that he endured, him carrying his cross, then Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross the rest of the way. Well, in this week's lesson, we're going to pick up with Jesus on the cross between the two criminals in Luke 23, verses 32 through 34. Now, the location of the execution of Jesus and the two criminals is Golgotha. Now, this is an Aramaic word that means the place of the skull. Now, that could mean uh, the hill where the executions took place resembled a skull, or it could be that the skull represented death, and the place of the skull could just have been a way of, of referring to, of saying that uh, where, where the site was, where the executions took place. Well, a crucifixion was, it was a gruesome way to die. We covered that a few lessons ago. It was meant to be both a punishment to the one being executed as well as a crime deterrent as people watched and could see what would happen to them if they went down that path. Well, here's what the Encyclopedia Britannica has to say about crucifixions. Usually the condemned man, after being whipped or scourged, dragged the cross beam of his cross to the place of punishment where the upright shaft was already in place in the ground. Stripped of his clothing, either then or earlier at his scourging, he was bound fast and with outstretched arms to the crossbeam or nailed firmly to it through the wrists. The crossbeam was then raised high against the upright shaft, made fast to it, uh, about 9 to 12 feet from the ground. Next, the feet were tightly bound or nailed to the upright shaft. Uh, a ledge inserted about halfway up gave some support to the body. Um, over the criminal's head was placed a notice stating his name and his crime. Death ultimately occurred through the combination of constrained uh, blood circulation, organ failure, and asphyxiation as the body strained under its own weight. It could be hastened by the shattering of the legs from an iron club, which prevented them from supporting the body's weight and made inhalation more difficult, accelerating both asphyxiation and shock. So that's what the Encyclopedia Britannica, a secular source, has to say about Roman crucifixions. Well, Jesus was nailed to a cross and placed between two criminals, one on either side of him. And you may have heard a sermon series uh, on the last seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. Well, Luke only recorded three of those statements. And the first one's in verse 34 where he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Now, remember Jesus had been up all night. He had endured a mark, mock trial. He'd been scourged. And a crown of thorns was placed on his head. And he was nailed to a cross. He endured both physical pain and emotional agony. And here he has the clarity of mind to personally exhibit the quality that he mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 30, uh, 43 through 44, where he said, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but, enemy, but I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that's what he was doing right here. Well, at the end of verse 34, it says that they, being the Roman soldiers, not the thieves, were casting lots for Jesus' clothes. Well, this fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm twenty-two, eighteen, that says, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. In fact, when you read Psalm 22, you see it's chocked full of prophecies about Jesus' crucifixion. So I'm going to detour just for a moment or two and mention something that I talked about in my Wednesday night class just last week. The beginning of Psalm 22 says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, that was one of Jesus' last words, recorded statements from the cross. When Jesus spoke 
that. We see that in Matthew 27, 46. I don't believe Jesus was saying this because God literally turned his back on Jesus. Now, I've heard that preached before. Have you? That on the cross, Jesus turned his back on, on Jesus because uh, God just couldn't stand to look at sin. Well, how much sin does it take for God to turn his back? You know, I hope he's looking at me all the time. Well, think about this. If I were to say the phrase, just as I am without one plea, okay, you'd probably recognize that as a hymn. You might even start thinking about the lyrics of that song. Well, the book of Psalms is a song book. And I believe that Jesus was quoting the first verse of the psalm so that the Jews who are surrounding him, they're going to recall that psalm and realize the prophecy that was being fulfilled right before their very eyes. Here are some selected verses out of Psalm 22. Listen to this. I am scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Well, we're going to see more of Psalm 22 prophecies fulfilled in our remaining verses. But let's continue on right now in Luke 23, verses 35 through 43. And here we see some more of the Psalm 22 prophecies fulfilled, such as mocking, insulting comments, those things, and saying things like he saved or he rescued others, but he can't save himself. And dogs. Now, dogs was one way that Jews referred to Gentiles. As, um, as there were Roman soldiers, Gentile soldiers, standing around him. Now, typically, at a crucifixion, the person's name and the crime was written and nailed on the cross, like I read out of the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Luke records the inscription as this. This is the king of the Jews. Now we're going to look here at some of the other gospels record of how it was written. Matthew 27, 37 says, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark 15, 26 says, The King of the Jews. I've already mentioned Luke. Then John 19, 19 says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Well, even though the four gospel authors wrote down different inscriptions, I don't believe there's, a, there's an issue here of, of discrepancy. All are correct, but not all are complete. If we look at each inscription and we see what's, what's common and we see what's di and, and what's different, I believe we can conclude that each wrote a portion of what the inscription was. And I believe when we put it all together, we'll see the complete uh, inscription. As we look at this slide, that the complete inscription was probably, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now we get into what the two criminals are saying as they are they're hanging on the crosses. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark record that both criminals, they taunted Jesus. They probably picked up on the jeers from the surrounding crowd and they just joined in. The command of save yourself and us, coupled with the crowd's scoffing of he saved others, now save yourself. You know, it's reminiscent to me of, of Jesus' Jesus's temptation in the wilderness, just like Satan these folks demanded Jesus perform some miraculous sign to show the world who he really was. Well, both criminals taunted Jesus, but Luke gives us the rest of the story by telling that one of them obviously had a change of heart. One criminal chides the other and says that they deserve punishment. But this man, this Jesus, he hadn't done anything wrong. He then turns to Jesus and says to remember me, remember me when, when he, when Jesus uh, comes into his kingdom. This criminal had more faith in Jesus as the Messiah than most of his disciples who had, at that point had run off. Jesus answered the criminal and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. The criminal, now he couldn't testify as to how did, how did Jesus fit into the Trinity. He couldn't answer that. He wasn't baptized. He didn't complete any theological training course. No, he simply recognized his own sinfulness. He believed and he asked. That's the simplicity of salvation. And so what was Jesus' response to this request? Today you will be with me in paradise. Today, not eventually. And that's the promise that we have as well, that as soon as we take our last breath, our spirit will be with Jesus in paradise in heaven. Paul reiterates this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, where he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
Our last set of verses is down in Luke uh, 23, verses 44 through 49. And here the Bible speaks of darkness uh, falling over the land for three hours. Hey, here in Arkansas, the big news is that just in a couple of weeks, we're going to experience a total solar eclipse. Most places that's in that band of total, um, total solar eclipse is going to experience somewhere between three and a half and four minutes of total darkness. I'm about 35 miles away from the total eclipse, but, you know, I'm close enough to where uh, there's only going to be a sliver of the sun visible during that time. You know, some folks have tried to explain the darkness over the land that's recorded in the Bible with a solar eclipse. That's okay, but there's a couple of problems with doing that. The first is that Passover coincides with a full moon in the spring, while an eclipse requires a new moon. Two different kinds of moons here. You got, you got to have uh, got to have the new moon to have the eclipse. The second is this: uh, that three hours is far too long for the effect of an eclipse. So instead of trying to explain this scientifically, I just accept it as a miraculous event. Kind of like the next thing that's mentioned: the tearing of the curtain. Now that curtain in the temple uh, it separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple. It was it was an area. Uh, the Holy of Holies was an area that the high priest could enter just one time a year to offer a sacrifice for the people. And the tearing of the, the curtain was both miraculous and it was significant. It was miraculous because the curtain was about four inches thick. Okay, that's about that thick. That's pretty thick. Uh, and it was between 40 and 60 feet high. Now, I picture in my mind kind of like a curtain that you see in a theater that rises at the beginning of a play. And so tearing that size of material would be impossible, especially since it was ripped from the top to the bottom. It was truly miraculous. But it was also significant because it now meant that we have direct access to God. We don't need a priest or anyone else to to make a sacrifice for us. Jesus is our great high priest, and he was the ultimate sacrifice. Well, there's a a four-and-a-half-minute video on the website that I have listed down below here. And it explains all this about the tearing of the curtain in in a very uh, easy-to-watch format. It's very, very well done. It's in a a cartoon format, so it's interesting to watch. Uh, So if you have time, you might play that in class. Well, verse 46 tells us that before taking his last breath, Jesus quoted another Old Testament passage. Psalm 31, 5. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. After this, we have three similar but different reactions to Jesus' death. And again, I think this was similar to what Jesus did by quoting Psalm 22 earlier. I'm thinking that the Jews surrounding him uh, recalled that psalm and thought about what it said as well. Here's some of the select verses from Psalm 31. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. You have not given me into the hands of the enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, and and my, my soul, my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish, and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. Because of my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors and the object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery, for I hear many whispering terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life, but I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. Let their lying lips be silenced, for with pride and contempt they speak arrogantly against the righteous." In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Do you see the common thread between Psalms 22 and 31? The common thread that ties those two together? In in Psalm 22, is that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here in 31, toward the end, it says, in my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. When Jesus uttered these quotations from the Jewish songbook of the day, the book of Psalms, the Jews who had come out to witness the execution were able to put together the the message of these two Psalms and realize that this indeed was the Messiah. Perhaps that's why they left beating their breast. You know, it was a sign of mourning, as verse 48 tells us. That was one reaction to the death of Jesus. Some had come to be entertained and, and watched this religious rebel die, but later realized that he was who he said he was. The other reaction was from the centurion who was on duty to carry out the execution. He saw Jesus' reaction to the insults hurled at him. He witnessed the things that happened in nature, like being in darkness, 
feeling the earthquake that Matthew 27, 54 tells us about. He claimed that Jesus was not only a righteous man that we see in verse 47, but also the Son of God out of Matthew 27, 54. Then there was the reaction of those who knew him, some of his followers, including some women who, who just stood at a distance and they took it all in. You know, I kind of liken this to Mary pondering all these things in her heart out of Luke 2.19. They were just processing all that had happened. Well, the death of Jesus was not an accident. It was planned even before Adam and Eve. As Revelation 13.8 tells us, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. His death was prophesied hundreds of years before baby Jesus was even born in Bethlehem. And think about the Jewish sacrificial system. At Passover, a perfect lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus' death occurred at Passover. It was a substitutionary atonement. It, the sacrificed lamb was, was offered, taking the punishment for the people who actually sinned. It was also a blood atonement because without the shedding of blood, uh, there's no forgiveness of sins like uh, Hebrews 9.22 states. Jesus, the willing substitute, took the punishment for our sin. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't plan B. This was God's intent all along. Next week is Easter Sunday, and we're going to be looking at the resurrection of Jesus out of Luke 24. This is a great time to contact everyone in your class. It's probably going to be, at least your services are going to be more full than usual. Hopefully your class will be as well. So let's uh, prepare ourselves Prepare our hearts for next week for Easter Sunday. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And don't forget to pray for and with your class.